2023. Are we live? I think we're not audible in the room. Okay. It is now. Okay. We'll try again. Good evening and welcome to the June 15th, 2023 meeting of the Planning Commission for the City of Santa Cruz. It's nice to see everybody. Could we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Conway? Here. Dawson? Here. Gordon? Kennedy? McKelvey? Here. Maxwell? Olhemus? Here. Okay. Do we have any statements of disqualification this evening? Seeing none, um, we will move on to oral communication. Um, this is the point in the agenda where um, anyone is welcome to speak to uh, the commission about anything that is within the planning commission purview but is not on tonight's agenda. So um, members of the public are invited to speak. Okay, thank you, seeing none, uh, we will move on to approval of minutes. Um, we have before us approval of the minutes of May 18th, 2023. Is there a motion to approve? I, I just have a question really quick. Mm -hmm. um, I thought I remembered that I made the motion um, for approval. Did, does anybody have the recollect? I didn't have a chance to go to the video, <laughs> so. If, if nobody else remembers, I'll, we'll probably just skip it and approve it. We can um, pull them and have them on for approval at the next Yeah, can, can we do that? Because I just didn't have a chance to look. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So those will be referred to uh, the next agenda. Okay. We have um, one public hearing on tonight's agenda, and we will move along to that. This is a public hearing. Um, regarding 1811 and 1815 Mission Street, which is project number CP22-0045, um, APNs 004124-34, 004124-32. And do we have a staff report? Yes. <laughs> um, so good evening, Vice Chair Conway and members of the Planning Commission. My name is Rena Zhou, and I am the project planner for the project at 1811 and 1815 Mission Street. The applicant is proposing a three-story mixed-use building, um, and they're proposing 23 single-room occupancy units, which is SROs for short, and four flexible density units, which is FDUs for short, um, equating to 27 residential units at this property. The applicant requires a residential demolition authorization permit, a boundary adjustment application, a special use permit, design permit, as well as a density bonus request for the proposed project. And they're also proposing a ground floor commercial space. So to start off, the project location, it's made up of two sites located south of Mission Street, east of Dufour Street, and west of Palm Street. There was some, there may have been some confusion regarding the um, location of the project with people thinking that it might have been at the corner of Dufour and Mission. So I do want to make that clarification that um, it is bound on three sides um, with other properties and it's located like one property in from Dufour Street. So these two properties are designated as community commercial um, CC in the general plan uh, designation, as well as, as zoned as CC as well, and located in the Mission Street Urban Design Plan. And all of these designations and zoning support mixed use developments in this location. So to talk a little bit about the timeline of the project, on January 21st, 2022, the pre-application was submitted pursuant to Senate Bill 330. So SB 330 seeks to streamline um, the review and entitlement of housing projects, including affordable units. Uh, on April 4th, 2022, a community meeting was held, and this provided the um, community with the opportunity to view the proposed project, ask questions, and also to provide feedback. The pre-application was deemed complete pursuant to the Housing Accountability Act on April 12, 2022. And what this means is that the project was only is only subject to the local ordinances and policies in effect on the day that it was deemed complete. So this project is not required to conform to any of the recently adopted city ordinances. However, it is 
permitted to take advantage of any state laws that have come into effect prior to the approval of this project. On September 20, 2022, the formal application was submitted and that's what we're discussing tonight. So this is a picture of the buildings that are proposed to be demolished. Because they were built in 1920 and 1926, they are more than 50 years old, and so they require residential demolition authorization permits um, in order for staff to also review the relocation assistance and replacement housing requirements as well. Um, relocation assistance and replacement housing under Senate Bill 330 is more restrictive than the local ordinance and it applies to housing development projects such as this, which proposes two or more dwelling units. So the applicant has advised that one of the dwelling units um, was occupied within the last five years, and because the income level of the tenants that are living there is unknown and cannot be determined, um, as per state law, staff have to assume that uh, lower income households occupy that unit uh, in the ratios prescribed in state law. So by that calculation, it means that the applicant is required to provide one two-bedroom replacement unit that is restricted at the very low income level. So as you can see on this slide, this is the proposed um, second and third floor plans. And you can see that there are 11 SRO units and two FDUs provided on each floor. So in their first um, submittal, the applicant proposed 27 SRO units. And in this current um, proposal, they're proposing 23 SROs and four FDUs. And the reason behind why they're proposing it FDUs at this point in time um, is because, as I mentioned earlier, they have to provide one two-bedroom replacement unit. And since SROs are studios, they don't have a bedroom count. And so in order to meet that requirement, uh, the applicant is now proposing FDUs as well so that they can provide that one two-bedroom replacement unit. So now I'll explain a little bit more about um, affordable units. So because the property is designated as community commercial in the general plan, um, they have an FAR requirement, but there's no specific um, density range provided in the general plan. And so our zoning ordinance has specified that the base density has to be calculated based on a project that meets all of the applicable uh, development standards. So this is like setbacks, heights, uh, FAR. And so that's why there were two plan sets that were submitted for this proposed project. Uh, the base density plan set shows that 20 SRO units can be built at the maximum FAR, which becomes the base density units that we do all of our calculations off of. Now for the inclusionary housing requirements, 20% of the base number of dwelling units have to be made available to very low income households when there are um, SROs proposed in a housing development. So with 20 base density units, four affordable units are required at the very low income level in order to meet that 20% inclusionary requirements. Now the applicant is proposing three SROs and one FDU to be provided as, as affordable housing units at that very low income level. And the one FDU unit that they're proposing at the very low income level, um, they're going to count as both their inclusionary as well as replacement housing units, which is consistent with state law. As per state law, affordable replacement units can be counted as both replacement and inclusionary units if the most restrictive requirements are met. And the inclusionary units um, in the zoning ordinance are required to be maintained as affordable in perpetuity, um, while the replacement um, unit requirements under state law are required to be maintained as affordable for 55 years. So in this case, the inclusionary units in the zoning ordinance are more restrictive, and that's what would apply for that FDU. So that FDU will be maintained as affordable in perpetuity. So as per uh, state density bonus law, um, if 15% of the total conforming base density is designated as very low income, then development projects then qualify for a 50% density bonus. 
So this project is eligible for a 50% density bonus, but instead they are proposing a 35% density bonus. So this is calculated uh, based on the base density of 20 units again. So it results in seven density bonus units with a total of 27 proposed units. I do also want to clarify that Density bonus units are not included in the total units when calculating the number of affordable units as per the inclusionary housing requirements. So that 20% inclusionary housing requirement is calculated based on the 20 base density units and not the total 27 units that's proposed in this project. And this is in accordance with the municipal code as well as state law. So now I'll talk a little bit about the proposed waivers and incentives and concessions. So the first request that's made is a waiver to allow for an FAR of 2.34, which is greater than the maximum FAR of 1.75 allowed in that CC general plan designation. With the base density um, design plan showing that there can, uh, there can be 20 units constructed at that 1.75 FAR, any additional units constructed as per the density bonus would result in a greater FAR, and so that's why they're proposing um, a waiver for that. The second request is an incentive and concession to allow for one accessible SRO unit uh, located on the ground floor, which is currently not permitted in the Mission Street Urban Design Plan. So an elevator is required to provide handicapped access to the second and third floor if the applicant is not able to provide a ground floor accessible unit. Um, and so the applicant provided a letter and a cost estimate explaining that the expense of installing and maintaining that elevator would essentially render the project infeasible from an economic standpoint. The third it request is a waiver to open space requirements. The applicant is proposing a common area located in the center of the second and third floor um, and so since it's fairly enclosed, staff don't really consider it to meet the common outdoor open space requirement in the zoning ordinance. So, so to that extent, the applicant is applying for a waiver to those open space requirements. If they had to redesign the building to meet our open space requirements, it would have to be a smaller building, and that would impact the number of units that they can construct. And I also want to add that this waiver for open space requirements can also qualify as an incentive and concession because in their base density plan set, the applicant also um, shows that they can meet their open space requirement through providing a rooftop deck. However, they would have to construct an elevator in order to do so, and they've already provided that cost estimate explaining that the elevator would be too expensive. Um, just to go back one more slide, I just wanted to also um, emphasize that the city is required to grant the requested waivers and incentives and concessions unless a specific adverse consequence to health or safety would result and no such uh, adverse consequence has, has been found by city staff. So now my next few slides are going to talk about uh, how the applicant has addressed some public comments and concerns as well as staff public comments, staff comments and concerns as well. And so to start off um, with the parking concerns, we've received some public comments about um, the number of parking spaces provided in this development to the ratio of the number of residential units being proposed. So as per Assembly Bill 2097, which came into effect on January 1st, 2023, a public agency is prohibited from imposing any minimum automobile parking requirement on any residential, commercial, or other development project that's located within a half mile of a major transit stop, which these properties are located within. And so the city is essentially prohibited from imposing any minimum automobile parking requirement on the proposed project. With that being said, the applicant is still proposing 11 parking spaces uh, for this development, and they are also offering to pay for uh, a neighborhood permit parking program for two years. However, I do want to note that the neighborhood permit parking program does have to be initiated by the neighbors and will be dependent on the administrative procedure noted in the municipal code and whether or not it gets um, approved. 
So we've, uh, we've also received public comments, and uh, staff have also provided comments regarding uh, fire access concerns as well. And so on this slide, you can see that the previous design shows this proposed development built almost to the property lines with decks on all elevations um, and no way for the fire department to access the back of this building. With the current design, the applicant is proposing a different construction type. They're proposing a construction type 3A with fire sprinklers, which means that they no longer require emergency escape and rescue openings, which means that they no longer require um, fire department access to the back of the building to access any emergency escape and rescue openings. Having said that, even though it's not required, the applicant has heard the public comments and concerns regarding having no access to the back of the building. So they are still providing a uh, a way for the fire department to access through um, the lobby, a fire rated lobby, fire rated corridor, through a fire rated stairwell to get to the back of the building where there is a roof over the garage so that the fire department will have access to those units at the back. Um, we did also receive some comments about um, concerns regarding the potential for that stairwell to be obstructed. And so, um, we are now proposing to include some conditions of approval about providing a signage on that door to ensure that it remains unobstructed. And I will read that into the record now. So the first one is, prior to issuance of the building permit, the building permit plan set must show the location of where the permanent sign will be posted on the door leading to the rear of the second story of the building. The sign must state that the door must be locked at all times for fire access only, and that the door must remain unobstructed at all times. Prior to finaling the building permit, a permanent sign must be posted on the door leading to the rear of the second story of the building, stating that the door must be locked at all times for fire access only, and that the door must remain unobstructed at all times, and that's the second um, condition of approval. So aside from the fire access concerns, there were also comments and concerns regarding privacy. This is the pr previous design that's shown on the slide, and it shows that essentially on all sides of the elevation, there are decks proposed, and they are almost built to the property lines. With the current design, the applicant has, um, they've they pulled back the rear building wall as well as the decks, and so now there's an 11 foot setback to the rear of the building from the property line and a seven foot setback to the uh, back of the deck from the property line. And the applicant has also separated these decks out. Instead of having one long continuous row of decks, they've now separated them to, um, to decrease the size of the decks and to discourage any large gatherings from occurring out there to kind of help um, to kind of help with the privacy concerns and any impacts to the residential houses located south of this development. The applicant has also removed all the decks and windows and openings from the side elevations since they are built to the property lines, except for these two openings on the west elevation here, um, which is set back five feet to allow for some light and air into that center common area. So staff all has also uh, received some comments and concerns regarding traffic circulation in and out of the proposed development. So with regards to this um, comment, I do want to note that there is a solid double yellow line along Mission Street, um, also known as Highway 1. And it is legal in the state of California to cross a double yellow line in order to enter and exit uh, a driveway approach. So with that being said, staff proposed another condition of approval to be included, which will prohibit any left turns coming out of this development, turning left onto Mission Street. And so I would like to um, read that condition of approval into the record now. Prior to finaling the building permit, a sign shall be installed at the driveway entrance slash, slash exit to prohibit left turns out of the proposed development. 
So I do want to continue um, to note that based on the low level of trips um, that will be generated from this proposed development, a no traffic study was required. Um, and regarding any potential changes or improvements made to the road alignment on, on Highway 1 or Mission Street, um, we've received questions um, and concerns about that. I do want to note that um, Highway 1 is under the Caltrans jurisdiction. And if there are any proposed changes to road alignment, there is not really necessarily uh, related or tied to this project specifically. Um, so with that being said, um, staff was able to make all the findings for the project approval. And I do want to make some notes to, um, uh, regarding revisions to the conditions of approval. Um, the first one is to delete the condition of approval number 58 because it is a duplication of condition of approval number 56. And the second is to revise the first bullet point under condition of approval number 32 to obtain a building permit for the construction of the new mixed use building um, instead of uh, noting it as a single family dwelling unit. So with that being said, staff recommends that the Planning Commission acknowledge the environmental determination and approve the proposed project uh, with the revised conditions of approval. And that concludes my presentation and I'm available for any questions. Great, thank you very much. I failed to take the opportunity to welcome Ms. Zhu to the staff. Did I pronounce your name right? Um, it's, yeah, so. So, <laughs> yeah. okay, thank you. Um, so this is her first presentation to the Planning Commission, and nice job. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, welcome. Um, so for starters, um, I wanted to see if the applicant um, was planning on making um, a presentation. Okay, and uh, so go ahead. You have up to 20 minutes. Um, hello everyone, can you hear me? Uh, my name is Andy Goldberg. I'm the developer of Mission Studios Santa Cruz. Peter Spellman and I, um, Peter's the project architect, we both live locally, so it was especially important for us to envisage a residential building that would enhance the city in general and the west side in particular, where we both live. So thanks for your interest in the project, and thanks also to Rena and the other city staff who have worked so closely with us to create a project that will provide the much needed housing on the west side, and also maybe, hopefully, kickstart a much needed upgrade to Mission Street. Um, this aspect was put in perspective for me when a former UCSC professor came back to visit recently and she was astonished. Mission Street is exactly the same as it was 10 years ago, she said to me. Nothing has changed. And with one or two exceptions, she was totally right. So hopefully, by the next time she comes, she won't be able to say that anymore. Um, we believe we've hit the sweet spot with our design, that it's the right project in terms of the size and impact on the neighborhood, that it's the right project in terms of its west side location, and that with demand for housing at an all-time high, it's also a project that's coming at the right time. This project is one of the only multifamily projects to come to the west side in recent years. The west side is a part of town that is dominated more than anywhere else by single-family homes. And I hope we'll start seeing some more density come there in recent years, even if providing this housing going to take some getting used to by current residents. You know, Mission Street right now is a hodgepodge of strip malls, legacy stores, gas stations, fast food outlets, and non-conforming single-family homes. So, if you want to go to the next slide. So, Mission Street is exactly the kind of place where Santa Cruz should be building housing on major thoroughfare, it's close to all the amenities that city has to offer, and which is perfectly located to access them by bike, by foot, 
and by the plentiful public transportation options that are close by. Next slide, please. Our design goal was to find the right balance between providing attainable housing that will provide quality places for people to live, whilst minimizing the impact on the existing neighborhood in terms of design, traffic, and other effects. What we came up with was 27 unit building on three stories, including four very low income units. The ground floor will have 763 square feet of commercial space, a lobby for residents, 11 parking spots, and one living unit that's fully compliant with ADA requirements, making it suitable for a disabled person. There'll be 13 units each on the other two floors, both of which will be served by welcoming open seating areas that will encourage residents to mix and congregate on the interior of the building and thus reduce any noise impact to neighbors. Um, talking of neighborhood impact, Lena, next slide. Um, because of the location's great transport links and the city approved bike share program, amongst other things, we felt that we should go with a minimum number of parking spaces and at the same time to discourage the use of cars by residents uh, by providing secure bike parking for each and every unit um, and by encouraging the use of public transport um, and other um, mechanisms. The adjoining parcels uh, to the south of the project and also on Mission Street, they're all zoned commercial. And the building design and location means that there'll be minimal shading impact on the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, next slide, please. Mission Street traffic, that's another major local concern. Um, but this project, because it has such low number of parking spaces is not going to make the traffic on Mission Street any worse. It may even make it better because now there'll be 27 people who will be able to access all these local services without driving. Um, a lot of people are concerned about cars turning left into the parking lot, but there's only 11 spaces there. And I venture to say that there'll be less left turns in a day into that parking lot than there are in 30 minutes to Dufour Street where Starbucks is, um, you know, they get a lot more traffic. Um, next slide, please. We had a successful community meeting last year where we explained the concept and design to the neighbors. And as we promised then, we made a lot of changes to address these concerns. So delivery trucks will now be able to enter and turn around in the parking area. Uh, it'll be easy to roll out the trash containers. The size of the balconies was reduced to discourage gatherings that might interfere with the neighbors. Um, and we agreed to fund a neighborhood parking program. Um, some neighbors also had concerns about uh, the fire and safety codes. Uh, and we worked very hard in recent weeks with Tim Shields and John Gervasoni to address those concerns. And, you know, right now the building far exceeds all fire and safety codes. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we think that our design is a significant upgrade to the Mission Street uh, uh, streetscape. Um, and is um, very complementary to the Mission Street urban design plan that was created over 20 years ago, and which has only had a handful of projects so far um, come to fruition. Um, next slide, please. And we're going to start talking more about the specifics of the building, so I'm going to hand this over to Peter. Thanks, Andy. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you for your time. Um, I do want to thank also city staff on this project, Rena and um, Tim, John, Jeversoni. They've all been really uh, important allies in trying to figure out what's the right design for this site. Um, it's been a long process, and 
The community involvement has been robust in the past uh, month, which has resulted in a better project. Uh, there's been good dialogue even this week with uh, folks that are representing a larger portion of the near neighbors. So I want to thank those people for reaching out as well. Um, you know, in the big picture, this is exactly the project that the city has been looking for, a west side location. Um, almost every project that we've reviewed in the past decade has called into question the density being placed in other parts of this town and why not on the west side. So here we are, we finally found a place that we feel is trying to sensitively place a decent number of very small, affordable by design homes uh, into the neighborhood. You know, this is two essentially single family home size lots, right? It's just under 10,000 square feet, two, th two 5,000 square foot lots. And given the community commercial zone standards, right, to have the mixed use component, uh, all the amenities that are required for a building like this, it's, it's a tight fit, right? So fitting in parking, commercial space, upgrading the um, the urban character of the sidewalk experience, adding uh, people and bike parking and some landscape to that environment are some of the you know, benefits that we're able to bring to this project. Um, you know, we're required to build to the property line, so you have that as your beginning point, and then we try and figure out how do you get residential units above that that are trying to be sensitive in all directions to the neighbors. Um, Conceptually, we tried really hard to make this um, as, as small a feeling building as we could, right? It started out with this party of a three-story walk-up for cost reasons, right? Can we do a cost-effective three-story apartment building that feels like it's in Santa Cruz, right? It's essentially two buildings, right, that's open to the sky in between, and we fit in between there. Uh, the, the common open space for all the units. We felt like it was a, you know, a pleasure to have a space between where people are moving out throughout their day and going back and forth to their units and just having a place to engage with their neighbors um, in a simple way, right? Um, we'll get into some of that design as we look at those plans. So that, that was our challenge and our goal. And the, the site plan that you see up there now Again, you see the commercial and the lobby spaces facing the street, right? It has this sort of urban look to it. Um, it's a small blip on your car ride as you go by, but it's really meant to um, enhance the 20-year-old you know, Mission Street design guidelines, which unfortunately we haven't been able to promote with much development over the years. So we're hoping that we can um, continue to encourage that. Um, there's an in and out driveway, um, secure areas for bike parking for both the commercial and the residential uses, um, an enclosed trash area and mechanical space. It was a great idea from the near neighbors questioning, so what's going to happen when uh, you know, Amazon pulls up and they're dropping packages off hourly, if not you know daily kind of scenario. And uh, so we were able to fit in a a temporary parking space in front of where the trash area is, and that has a, you know, a backup space where it can come in and out, park for 10, 15 minutes, do their thing, and not have to sit out on Mission Street and back up the traffic. So that was a great idea from, from neighbors, and I'm glad that we were able to you know, solve that in a, in a very small footprint. Um, again, the, the parking, we have 11 spaces. Um, before the state law came into effect, this project only required 12 spaces, so we almost meet that. We only lost one space because we decided to keep the, fire, the dedicated fire access to the back of the building, even though it wasn't required. So we lost a parking space to do that, but we felt it was a good trade-off and a good, um, you know, I'm not saying a nod to the neighbors. I think their persistence in questioning uh, the fire safety of that condition is what uh, prompted you know, even further design thought into you know, how do we make that a safe space. And we feel like it's something that uh, will enhance the project going forward. Uh, it would also provide you know, maintenance opportunities onto that roof uh, over the garage, as well as fire access over time. 
Let's go to the next slide, Rena. This is the second floor of the building. Uh, again, you get a sense for um, the open space in between. Um, it looks a little diagrammatic. I would expect that tenants are circulating left to right through that space. There's some planting areas. There's some fixed seating areas for people to sit and, and share some outdoor space. Um, it is open to the sky. The, the third floor, let's go, well, let me tell you one, a few other things. The, let's go back to the second, sorry. So the orange spaces here are the uh, inclusionary units, right? We have two of the SRO units on the left side facing on mission, and then the larger flexible density unit, which is a really small two-bedroom unit, essentially, in, in the back of the building. Um, the other FDU in the upper left corner is a one-bedroom unit. The rest are all SRO, non-dedicated bedroom uh, spaces. Yeah, and the, and the yellow one is, is a dedicated manager's unit. So we, we are required and, and have a unit on site, uh, which will also be a, a conduit for communication to the neighborhood, both after this project is built, if there are concerns, if there are noise complaints that tenants are, you know, not being good neighbors, there's a, there will be a, a plan in place to, to address those issues. Let's go to the third floor. Third floor is very similar to the second floor, albeit uh, the open space has three 10 foot by 10 foot wide um, light wells, let's call it, that bring light and air. If you're standing on that second floor and you're looking up, you're looking up at, at the blue sky. Uh, we tried really hard, again, to give this building this feeling of not being in a sort of enclosed corridor condition. And you have this um, kind of outdoor living space that's part of your unit and part of your living experience. We were able to keep to the bottom of the page a large opening at each level, which is about 40 square feet. So it's a 10 foot uh, wide by four foot tall, almost window opening, let's call it, uh, to the west. So you'll get really nice late in the day sun coming through there, light, um, and I think it enhances the experience of that uh, open space. Go to the next slide, Lena. Rena. This is just an enlargement of a typical unit, one of the SRO units. So as you enter off the corridor on the right, you have a, a space that's open that could fit a queen-size bed, uh, could be the sleeping area. Um, you've got storage as you enter the unit and a fairly efficient kitchen with a full-size refrigerator and cooktop sink storage space and a full bathroom with a shower, toilet, sink. And the front of the unit is meant to be, again, fairly flexible, could be the living slash workspace slash sleeping. It's really up to the tenant to sort of figure out how to use that space. And then each unit has a small deck in front. Um, this is the mission side of the project. Those decks are only three foot six loud uh, as a projection over uh, the mission right of way. And they are slightly larger in back. They are just under yeah, they're 310. They're just under four feet in, in depth. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, the building materials, we, we do have a material board. I don't know if you guys had a chance to see that. Um, you know, the general um, thought behind this is we're, we're sort of a modern interpretation of a Santa Cruz vernacular. We're taking influences from places like the Tannery Arts Center, where you have uh, board and bat siding, stucco siding, and we introduced a, a, a wood element for the balcony railings to try and give it a little bit more of a residential flavor to it. The ground floor garage walls are all um, concrete masonry units. And the windows and storefronts are all black just to give it an overall um, theme for the building. Go to the next slide. These are some overall 3D views, kind of giving you a sense for that massing, although you never experience it this way. Uh, the slide on the right is, is the Mission Street facing side, uh, where you can see the attempt to, to break this up into two, two buildings. Uh, you see the driveway into the building on the right, storefronts on the front, the relationship to the 
single family home on the corner that do four. The image on the left shows you the back side of the building. We're looking at it sort of from the east, looking, looking west and north. And you see the, the garage with the roof over it and the residential balconies on that side of the building. The roofs are all single shed roofs that are dialed in for solar access. Uh, it's sort of a perfect setup, right? We're on the right side of the street, both for solar and minimizing the impact uh, from a shading standpoint uh, to structures around us, right? So we don't shade at all the properties behind us, uh, the single family homes. We do have minor impacts to the two adjacent houses that you see in this slide. Um, in the worst scenario, in the middle of uh, winter solstice where the sun's low and the shadows are longer, uh, we cover the house until about 9, 30, 10 in the morning. And it opens up pretty quickly. So I was presently surprised that there's very little impact. In the, at the worst time of the day in the summer, we only cover about a third of, of the structure on either side of us. Go to the next slide, please. And then this is, a, this is a section through the building, cut north-south and looking towards the east to give you a sense for sort of the open common space in between the two buildings where people would be circulating and getting into their units. And an idea of the relationship at the back of the building with the roof over the garage. There's diagrammatically some fire department ladder shown there with those would be accessing the third floor units um, if and when needed. They wouldn't be there permanently. They would be brought, brought in if there were a fire emergency. Um, and then, you know, significantly, we've altered the, the makeup of this structure by the construction type, right? A 3A construction type is significantly safer from a fire safety perspective. Uh, very robust sprinkler system. All the exterior walls are two-hour fire rated walls. There's fire separations between the garage and the residential above. So any fire that would, if there were a fire in the garage, it's not going to spread to the rest of the building and vice versa. Um, and again, it, it took us out of the, the requirement to have a fire department access to the back of the building. I think that's it, right? Nicely timed. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all. Thank you very much. So at this point, um, I'd like to ask if commissioners have any questions of either staff or of the applicant, um, after which we will open up for public comment. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Dawson. So this isn't necessarily um, about the specifics of the project. It's more a question about the zoning. And you know, our, one of our main jobs here on the Planning Commission is to make sure we have consistency <coughs> with the general plan. And so I, I was just wondering if staff could talk a little bit. Um, so you said that this was zoned community commercial. Um, and m m I know that there's been some changes that the council have made around FDUs being allowed in community commercial, but as the general plan sits right now, is it consistent with the general plan to have FDUs in this project? Uh, thank you for that question, Commissioner Dawson. Um, I do want to clarify, say yes, um, that, FD, that proposing FDUs is consistent with the community commercial um, designation. I, so the intent of the community commercial designation is really to accommodate businesses that um, serve the general needs of the community and includes like retail, service, office, establishments, et cetera. And so there are uh, multiple different types of uses as well in this area. Um, as well as mixed use projects that include um, like commercial uses on the ground floor. And for mixed use pro projects for that residential unit type, um, that is like the SROs are a type of residential um, unit type that is 
allowed within that community commercial zone district um, if as long as a special use permit is obtained and FDUs are also included within that um, cat like that list as well that where they are allowed within the that community commercial zone district um, as long as the applicant is obtaining a special use permit um, and that's why that's one of the entitlements that they would require okay thanks it for questions um, yeah I think I think for now that's it okay. for questions okay, thank you <laughs> anybody else yes Commissioner Paul Hamas <laughs> thank you Commissioner Conway um, I just want to follow up on our, our email conversation about the um, potential for um, of course I'm gonna forget the name let me look up the email we talked a little bit about um, they called delineators or something like that uh, that can run down Mission Street. And I know that we talked about how technically this is kind of Caltrans's call, right? And this is a highway and um, we're sort of limited, or at least the sense I get is that we're limited in terms of what we can require in terms of trying to limit those left turns. And so is there any more information about that or is it just kind of like this is Caltrans's <laughs> jurisdiction and there really isn't much we can do with that? Um, so from my understanding, you're right, it is. Caltrans jurisdiction. Um, and so I think with that signage um, prohibiting left turns out of the development, that will definitely help with some of those, like the, with those traffic um, concerns. And then I think from also looking at the aerial photograph of the um, the site, um, this morning we, we talked it through with the public works traffic engineering, and it also doesn't really look like there's enough right of way space there to have like left turn pockets or um, other types of improvements as well. Um, and so that's kind of um, the response there. Yeah, I, I drove by it on the way here. It's, it's tight. Um, probably not a lot of space for that. And I guess the reason that I ask about this, I mean, aside from, you know, driving on Mission Street, my entire life and generally trying to avoid it because of those left turns and the nightmare it can become. Um, I just, the intent here is to not make a bad situation worse. And so I'm just trying to see kind of what we can do. Um, and the other uh, question I had is that are, those parking spaces are not dedicated parking spaces, correct? To the residential component, they're just spaces. Um, yes, that's correct. From my understanding, they're not like assigned I think in the so in the draft um, SRO management plan the applicant might have included some information in there about how it's like a first come first serve um, basis where those tenants can purchase um, parking permits essentially so they're not like specifically assigned in that sense and I think there are also a portion that's going to be um, dedicated towards that commercial space as well. Yeah, that's my big question is that with um, the commercial space there and those um, parking spaces not being assigned that creates a different dynamic than say if it was just tenant parking or you know restricted to tenants or something like that. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah, I will, in response to that, I will say that, um, and this is even reflected in our zoning code, mm -hmm. um, that there is an element of shared parking that happens with the peak demand for residential happening in the evening times and then residential during the daytime. So there is um, sort of that shared parking model and our code even has exemptions for parking in that scenario. Right, okay, thank you. Yes. I have a couple of questions. Um, I understand that there are limitations on what the city can ask the developer to do. We don't wanna stop feasibility. Um, having said that, was there any thought given to even a stair climber for that ADA unit. I, I'm, I'm the, really the, uh, we're trying to squeeze a whole bunch of stuff in here and the, I completely acknowledge that. And it's, uh, it's a very, I think you guys have hit virtually all the targets. Um, I just am a little bit concerned about the, the address of that ADA unit being on the entry side, sort of the, the, the storage area and the the out the outdoor space being a very isolated patio in the rear and I completely understand the motive, the the basis for doing it in terms of accessibility 
but was there any thought given to any something short of an elevator, like a stair climber or anything like that? Is there, is have you had any thoughts about that? Because if you could get up to those open spaces, that would be a, I think, a life changing thing uh, for that particular unit. So that's, and I I have some general questions that maybe we'll get to later, but that was the one thing that really jumped out at me. So I don't know if you want to yeah, address we that now. Thought about it. Obviously, the elevator is the way to access that. Uh, if there's a way to do something different, mm -hmm. we haven't really thought about that concept. Yeah. As, as I'm not I'm sure we would be, be opposed could, to I that. I mean, maybe either stairway obviously would have impacts on the other units, but sure. that one aspect of it for both the nature of the unit, the nature of the access to it, the opportunities for socializing, um, the placement of the outdoor space relative to the other other unit. So yeah, no, I I hear your your comment. Um, our our thought was, and this was even brought up by staff early on. Um, you know, the lobby is another common space, True. right? That mm -hmm. people will be congregating in, mm -hmm. utilizing, living in. Let's call it. So that was our saving grace: was that they still have that space that they can use, albeit they can't if they were a handicapped individual. Yeah, it provides opportunities for those, you know, short uh, sure. kind of glancing. Uh, connections for people and those are really important but uh, just the nature of the placement and the access and everything it feels very isolated so. uh, that, ADA unit, uh, sorry, that ADA unit does have the advantage of having a private open space and we've taken uh, special measures to ensure that there's plenty of light coming in there mm -hmm. um, so I think all in all, it will be a very nice place to live. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, sorry. more questions from? Yeah. Sorry, I, I just had a couple more. So I, I heard, um, did hear in your presentation that you said it is consistent with state law, but I, I would like to ask you to be a little bit more specific about how a one-to-one -one replacement of an affordable unit gets counted in the inclusionary requirement. Um, to me, it seems very, if you're going to do a one-to-one -one replacement of an affordable unit, that would be counted as one thing, and then the affordable requirement should be, um, you know, applied to the project. So I think there may be some interpretation there, and if there's our, there is an ability for us to make a requirement um, or to have that affordable unit, be placed one to one and then have our inclusionary go and I, I think I would be interested to hear about that. Um, so thank you for that question. Um, so so with regards to that question, it is written within um, within state law directly within government code sections um, six six three zero zero. D2A2, as well as 65915C3A1, um, that the that any like replaced uh, protected units can count towards that local inclusionary requirements um, if they meet the requirements of the city's inclusionary ordinance. And and so that that that's the part of the state law that that explains that. Um, they can basically be double counted, um, and that the more restrictive um, requirements do take uh, do take precedence. And so that's kind of why I explained that the inclusionary um, requirements are where the units have to be maintained as affordable in perpetuity, whereas under the state law, if they're just doing that one to one um, re replacement unit, it only has to be affordable for 50, um, restricted as affordable for 55 years. And so the applicant is, is choosing to do to double count both like to count um, the replacement unit as the inclusionary unit as well, and to uh, provide that affordable unit uh, as affordable in perpetuity rather than just the 55 years. Um, and I just want to add, sorry, I'm in the broken chair again, so I'm really low. <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, the, we, we, on previous projects, we had been relying on just our local code, our local ordinance, which um, had the term may in it. Um, and that has been interpreted by the Planning Commission um, for some projects to mean that there's the discretion involved and that we could allow for it to be 
counted as an inclusionary unit or not. Um, and that was prior to this state law section coming into play, which um, further defined it and specified that it has to be able to be counted as one of our required affordable units. Yeah, I, I mean, I will, I will just say can is different than shall. And I'll, I mean, we don't have to continue to go into it, but I, what I do want to just state to the public is what that this results is us getting less affordable units now, right? Like instead of five affordable units, we're getting four affordable units. So um, I'll probably have more questions about that. Thank you. Okay. Um, I guess I'm down to really, I just have um, one question. Well, I guess, first of all, I'm assuming that what you're calling the leasing office is also the property management office that's always available. So that there's somebody there for that, which I was, you know, very glad to see. And also, the is there visitor bike parking? This is one of my current pet peeves. Is that in front? That is okay. Good. Um, that's easily accessible and lockable and all that. Great. Thank you for that. I have um, rhetorical questions that I'll save everyone from, which is really just hand wringing. But what can we do about Mission Street? So um, you know, <laughs> we'll skip that. Um, okay. With that, uh, with questions, I am going to open the public hearing. Um, members of the public are invited to speak for three minutes. What we'll ask you to do is line up over here, um, sign in, and if you could please state your name. Also, um, prior to the meeting, I was asked whether um, one person could also speak for a neighbor who's unable to be here, and um, we have enough time to allow for that. Um, so you can also make your neighbor's comments on his behalf. Um, uh, you can just state his name. It would be helpful. Oh, wait. How many minutes do you want to do? Three minutes, and then she can have up to three. I don't think her comment, his comments will take that long, but I'm going to allow that. I practice. It might be a little over three, but I'll try to speak fast. There will be a yellow light giving you a heads up that your okay. red light is coming. So my name is Dana Rayfield. I live at 543 Palm Street, and I have concerns about the Mission Street project. The first one is privacy. Uh, the second and third floor on the back side will be looking down on numerous properties, backyards, that for most people are considered private. Looking at the plans, I acknowledge and appreciate the developer's use of privacy handrails, which is a solid wood and not the wire transparent railings. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, the uh, third one is parking. Um, I know the intention of the developer is to incentivize biking and discourage driving. But the reality is that we are not there as a country, state, or town. In California, the average household has 1.68 cars with 27 units. That's 45 cars. And with what looks like 11 parking spots on the project, this will account for 15% of residents. I would assume this is actually much lower since I'm sure some of those spots for the commercial, some of those spots would be for the commercial patrons and workers. On DeFore and Palm, Parking after work hours or at peak coffee times can be challenging to say the least. Perhaps parking needs to be provided and added to the plans for all 27 units. If that's not feasible at the minimum, Palma de Four need to be permitted and Santa Cruz City not allow for the Mission Street parking residents to get those um, permits. The third one is fire safety and rescue. I am a firefighter here in the county. I feel that I have a significant understanding of how to perform rescues. I understand that it has passed code. Currently, it appears that there is zero setbacks on access to either side of the buildings. This will prevent easy access to the back of the building for fast rescues. If there is a fire in the rear apartments, they have two options, their front door or their back deck. If the fire starts at the front door, that leaves the back deck. <clears throat> I saw the updated plans with the access to the stairwell. We cannot get ladders up stairwells, interior stairwells. We cannot. We only allow for attic ladders can go up stairwells. So to get to the second and third floor, we have to have access outside of the building to throw a 24-foot ladder that will 
access the second and third floor. So now to do that, you're gonna require us to go through neighbor, the neighbor's yard to probably break fences to then try to make it up and over to the property to that second and third floor for people hanging outside of those decks. So with no access on either side of that building, we cannot get there in a time and effective manner. And now the big picture. So I'm concerned that the, bl the planning commission were not thinking of the future and we're not too concerned of what Oh, dang it. And what is in front of them? <laughs> okay. Um, you can finish your thought. Okay. Looking under your guys' significant projects and the active planning applications, there are 45 applicants. Of those, 36 are residential. Of those 36 residential, that's 2,886 SRR, SROs, condos, and apartments, which can equivalent at up to 6,000 to 7,000 people. Okay, thank you. Right now, our part, our streets, our water, our sewage, our parking does not go there. As a job as a firefighter right now, Santa Cruz City has the 10th busiest fire station in the United States. Are you guys prepared for an additional fire station that costs $30 million to build? For your comments. $10 million I've, I've you for the lot? Thank you for your comments. I just They're don't think we're there helpful. yet. And you also had comments from your neighbor. Yes. So this is from Bruce. Um, his main one that he wants to talk about is fire safety on Mission Studios remains a major concern, especially revised plans, including the package agenda for June 15th. The revised plans are more dangerous than the previous posted plan plans because the revised plans limit rear building firefighter access to a stairwell that is more than likely to become obstructed than an 18 foot wide parking entrance shown in the previous plans. The revised plans also provide no way for firefighters to access the rear wall of the building from the ground floor if the stairwell is obstructed. Fire department access to the rear wall of the building needs to be more thoroughly revised. The previous design is clearly safer than the revised design that is contained in the agenda packet. The previous design can also be made more fire safe by using class A building materials on the rear decks. Fire safety remains a major concern and one of the cities and one that the city should take seriously for the city will bear liability for any loss of life or property that occurs due to shortcomings of the fire department access, access aspects of building plans approved by the city. Safety petition. I petition the planning commission to only approve this project if the following condition or an equivalent is added to the conditions of approval. Quote, prior to instance of building permits, the building permit plan shall show a design that is determined to provide the least likely to be blocked and, I don't know what the word is, broadest, broadest access to the rear wall of the building as determined by a panel of no less than five firefighting building and risk assessment professionals with at least one member from each professional group whose determination is documented in a publicly available written report, report end of quote. Uh, it would also be a good to add a following condition as well. Quote, property owner agrees to have the fire department perform annual inspection of mission, sh mission studios to make sure fire sprinkler systems and access pathways are operational and in good order, end quote. My neighbor and, I's neighbors and I are very concerned about the fire safety because the fire of Mission Street Studios could have significant adverse impacts on the health and safety of nearby properties. That's Bruce Thomas. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you can go ahead and sign in while you're waiting, if you'd like. Hello, my name is Joe Hudson. I'm a resident at 539 Palm Street, living with my wife and two kids. Um, my primary concern is the adverse impacts this will have on you know, Palm Street, Dufour Street, across the other side of Mission, Baldwin, Berkshire, Olive, uh, with the parking, the traffic. Um, the parking, I think it's too many units with not enough parking spaces. And I know this is meets all the guidelines and you know, these guys have done a good job trying to address uh, neighborhood concerns, but I think to pretend that persons living in these units will not have vehicles is not being realistic. And the city of Santa Cruz and the developers and, and, and additional projects throughout the neighborhood that will certainly come to follow will really negatively impact, you know, not only our quality of life, but, you know, safety and, you know, other concerns and parking, number one access to our homes, and then also Bayview School just around the corner. 
um, increased traffic, increased competition for parking during drop-off and pickup times. So I think it's just, um, if you extrapolate out that there's five other parcels that are community commercial on that block, you know, and he is developing two of them, um, you know, that could be, you know, several times what's there. So you're looking at close to 100 units with, you know, 30 or 40 parking spots. And all those cars are certainly 100% going to be um, covering the neighborhood. And I've, you know, I've spoken with many um, folks who do property management, and they've um, just absolutely agreed that persons, you know, a lot of UCSC students, of course, bring a car to town. And so I think believing that that's not going to be the case and not addressing it with either offsite. I don't know how else you address it because you're trying to get as many parcel, uh, many units as possible in as small a space. I understand that. But um, I think it's too many, too much with not enough concern for where these people are going to use their vehicles. And also the, the other issues on Mission Street, you know, safety, getting on and off mission. We, in our backyard at 539 Palm, I can sit there and listen to car accidents daily. Come in front, and I'm sure the fire department's going to attest to the number of per, uh, car accidents right there in front of that Starbucks. So it's just, I feel like it's too much on too small of a space, but you know, that's just my perspective. And I think if the parking could be mitigated, then you're going to get more buy in from the folks nearby. Not that that matters, but that's, I think, a, a, a valid concern. So thanks. Thank you for your comments. Eastman 519 do four. Um, so back to your rhetorical question, what about Mission Street? <laughs> um, I've been thinking about how people are going to access right this project. I turn left onto do four street often daily. Um, and the traffic that gets blocked up trying to go left, you're adding more cars just slightly off, you know, from the, the, the Dufour Street access, you've got another driveway right next to it. So people are going to, I mean, I, I, will, will I have to wait behind this car to get to the next left turn to, you know what I mean? It's just going to be a freaking mess on Dufour Street, on Mission Street. The other part of that mm -hmm. is, okay, you're going to turn left. You're going to have a, a sign that says you can't turn right. No, you can't turn left out of the project. You can only turn right. So how are they going to go north? They're going to go right on Mission. They're going to go right on Palm. They're going to go right on Seaside. And then they're going to go up the next street, which is the one where the fire station is. I forgot the name of it. So I mean, the traffic in the neighborhood is going to be affected, not just by this you know, right or left turn, but they're going to be going all the way around the neighborhood just to get anywhere because of Mission Street. Um, the delivery trucks backing out of the project after doing a delivery, can you imagine a delivery truck backing out? That's the rhetorical question. Um, the other part of that is, uh, okay, I'm done with the parking and the driving. No, the driving, <laughs> the, done with the driving, sorry, I'm nervous. Um, the offer to pay for two years of parking permits, very kind, however, how long do the developers plan to collect rent from this project? Because we, as neighbors on these streets, plan to live in our homes for a lot longer than two years. Two years is nothing. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, hello. Uh, my name is Nicholas Ivy. I live at 546 Dufour Street. Um, so my first concern I want to talk about is something that's mentioned in the, the 225 page document, which is the sentence, a sun shadow analysis was provided, that, which shows that during the summer, the proposed three-star building will not impact solar access of adjacent properties. However, um, so my the owner of the house I live in went and compared the, the sun shadows thrown by the building across the street, the, the other three-story apartment building, and that doesn't seem particularly plausible um, since the shadows by that building go across all the way across Mission Street. Um, I believe, I'm not sure if these were submitted to you, but you, she attached photos to that document. Um, and so, you know, even if technically solar access will be there, you know, we have, you'll have sun, sun at some part of the day, but even if you lose a couple hours of uh, sunlight due to um, 
due to the building being occluded, that's like 15, 20% of your energy. Um, you know, so if you need to add 15 or 20% more panels, that drives, drives the cost of your solar installation up. Um, so that was my um, main first concern. You know, the parking parking's kind of been talked a lot, but um, I have to park, you know, I, I park on Dufour Street myself. Um, just the other week, I had the second time uh, someone bumped my bumper, just, you know, going back and I don't even know when they did it because they didn't leave a note. First time left a note, second time they did not. Um, so I'm also concerned about parking. We just have, now we have four people living in the house that I'm at. So it's going to be, you know, it's already, it's already a nightmare shuffling cars in and out of the driveway and dealing with the spaces in front of the house where, you know, some, so there's four people can fit in front of the house, but some, if someone who doesn't live at the house parks in front, they'll often block out two of the spaces by parking in between them. So then we have to take up more and more spaces across the street. Um, so those are my main concerns. So that's it for me. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there anyone else who would like to um, address the commission? Welcome. By the way, you're a good speaker. And all of you guys, I'm looking, I'm sitting there looking, I'm going, oh, God, these guys are so stiff. I'm never going to get anything across, but you're all smiling now. You know, it's like, okay, <laughs> I'm going to come up and... Anyway, my name is William McPherson, and I own the two houses right next door. Now, this is... And, and these are all my friends, and, and the whole neighborhood, they're, they're all complaining. And... Um, and you guys did a really good job. I liked your presentation on your building. The, the problem is I wanted to develop two. And I got two more houses right next door to Andy's. And if I developed, that's 27 more units because I'm going to duplicate what he's got. And that's going to freak out the whole neighborhood. And so I'm here because I want everybody to win, including planning department and you guys and you guys and so how can we resolve this where we're all going to be happy and so uh so anyway that's all i got to say thank you thank you we appreciate your comments would anybody else like to address the commission uh seeing uh you know not typically i'm sorry um uh, with that, I'm going to close the public hearing and um, thank everybody for their comments. Um, first of all, I'd like to ask if either staff or the applicant have any responses that they'd care to make to anything that came up. I see the applicant nodding. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Just, just quickly, a couple of things. Parking, um, uh, Yvonne, I think it was comments about that as well as the delivery trucks. The delivery trucks can turn around inside the garage. They don't have to back out onto Mission or vice versa. Right. No, that, that's okay. This isn't a time for a conversation. Um, the applicant has a chance to respond to specific yeah. right. things. Yeah, that were so delivery okay. trucks would, would enter into that garage. They have a, a temporary parking space, and then they're able to turn around inside the garage and then head back out. Just a clarification. On, on parking, this is really simple to me, right? We could provide no parking in this building. And we would be soliciting to people that didn't have a car. If there were parking permits in the neighborhoods, these people cannot get a permit on those streets. They couldn't park on your streets. It's that simple, right? I live downtown. Everybody uses my street to park, right? I have a parking permit. and. Supposedly, they're supposed to leave in a couple hours, but you know it's just the way it is, right? You can't, you can't protect the parking in front of your house, right? That's a public street and it's open to anybody. But the parking program works. If anybody got me a parking ticket, I seem to get more than my fair share. Um, it works, and it keeps people that shouldn't be there from being there very long. Um, so I, I don't see a parking impact from this project. 
don't have a parking permit process in place, yeah, they've got the opportunity, if they have a car, to unfortunately park in your neighborhood. So we're, we're encouraging that, and that's why we're offering to jumpstart the process in your neighborhood by paying for that for three years. I think that's a, a good balance to protect against that condition. That's where we stand on that. Thank you. Thank you. And Rena, did you have um, comments? Uh, yes. Um, is it possible to share my screen again, please? Right. So I did. I just did. Just want to bring this slide back up again, just to show everybody um, that over here um, in this right corner on the current design, there is that um, temporary parking space for the delivery trucks to park. And then the applicant has provided this um, turnaround space so that they can back up here and then turn around and be able to drive out uh, onto Mission Street. So that this prevents um, delivering trucks from having to back out, out of the development. Um, so I did want to show the visual of that. Um, and to, um, to kind of uh, reiterate what I also explained during my presentation as well with AB 2097, um, the city is prohibited from uh, imposing any minimum uh, automobile parking requirements uh, on this proposed project because they are located within a half mile of a major transit stop. Um, and in, they are lo also located within an urban environment and they're providing um, you know, a lot of bike parking spaces as well. And so people can, they can walk because it's located close to other residential uses um, where they can bike to get to these um, commercial the commercial space as well, um, aside from driving. Um, and to clarify an aspect, um, like regarding the um, traffic concern um, comments about the amount of traffic that this uh, proposed development could generate, um, from my understanding as part of the um, city's traffic impact fee program, if this project is not likely to increase 25 additional trips in the AM or PM peak hour at a critical intersection, then they're not required to provide a traffic study. And so we think based off of the low level of um, trips that this uh, proposed development will make um, with 11 parking spaces, it shouldn't, um, there shouldn't be like a, like a impact with the traffic situation already on Mission Street. Um, so I did want to make those clarifications and thank you for providing those comments as well. Um, and I also wanted to ask if Tim Shields might want to come up and clarify the fire access concern comments. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> um, I was going to ask too. So. <laughs> Vice Chair, uh, Commissioners, thank you for having me. So I just wanted to briefly touch on the fire access and what we really worked on um, looking at solutions to the emergency escape and rescue windows at the rear of the structure. Um, we had some difficulties in addressing that, but once the um, developer architect proposed a 3A construction, that exempted the need for emergency escape and rescue windows, so they're no longer required per code. So there is no code section that I can require to access back. Having said that, they still did provide a rated corridor for us to get to the rear of the structure. Um, I understand there are maybe some logistical challenges, um, but I can't, what if all the scenarios, I have to apply state code to this, and that's how I look at it at this point in the process. It's just a design review. Um, there will be another thorough review at the building permit review where we have a third-party contractor review the set of plans independent of um, my department. So. That'll get reviewed again, and if there's issues, then we'll address it at that point. Is there additional questions, sir? Nope. I was, I was just going to ask you to comment out in general. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Great. Thank you for your comments. That was oh, very helpful. Uh, one additional one. There was a concern about annual um, fire life safety inspections, and per state law, um, we're state mandated to inspect um, this type of um, structure, an R2 structure, annually anyways. So that is something that we already do. Okay. So this will be inspected annually. Great. Thank you for that clarification. Okay.
Um, with that, I will uh, return to the commission for deliberation, and I would just like to start by thanking neighbors for their active engagement. Um, this project um, represents a huge change, um, and asking questions and advocating for your concerns is really helpful, and clearly you've had um, some really positive effects on this project. So thank you for that. Um, with that, would any of the commissioners like to lead off? Okay, okay. <laughs> Commissioner Poy um, oh, McKelvey, sorry, I didn't know. I'll, uh, I'll just reiterate, I know that there are so many stakeholders and competing interests and layers of regulatory uh, it's a nice word for that. <laughs> uh, trying to fit it all into a package like this on a small piece of land is an incredible challenge, and I, I do think the developer has tried really hard to satisfy uh, both the technical requirements and kind of the, the, the community concerns. Um, I do still have a uh, strong desire to see something happen for that accessible dwelling unit. Um, I think that the public has made a number of other uh, concerns very apparent, and it sounds like there has been a fairly robust exchange of ideas and requirements, and um, I think that I'm hoping that there can be uh, maybe a continuation of that conversation amongst the parties, but um, I, I, I do think that uh, there's been a, it's, it looks like it's evolved to me and I, I'm, I'm thankful for that. Okay, is that it? That's it. For now, okay, Commissioner Paul Hamas. Um, I just have a few comments and then, um, Try to sew this up pretty quick here. Um, okay, for the first one, I just had a question for the developer, and I'm just curious. Um, this project was entitled to a 50% density bonus, and I'm just curious why you didn't take it. You know, yeah. Um, thank you for the question. Um, the the 50% density bonus wasn't practical. It would have meant putting even more units into a confined space and a greater impact on the neighborhood. And so that was something we wanted to avoid. Thank you. Yeah, okay. as, as expected. <laughs> I'm just curious, just wanna get it all on the table. Um, okay, um, so just really quickly, I wanna just address some of the comments of the public. Um, just on density, on traffic, on parking, just general increase in uh, in population in this particular area. Um, you know, I'm a I'm a West Side resident. I've lived on the West Side my entire life, and in particular, very close to this particular location. And I share a lot of those concerns, um, specifically around the impacts of traffic and parking, like especially with the left um, on southbound Mission, cutting across a couple lanes of traffic, backing up. Um, people who are traveling in that left lane, um, especially when there's a left into the, you know, Katrina Taqueria slash Pizzeria Avanti lot, there's the Dufour lot, there is Palm, there's a lot of lefts that are lined up in that particular neighborhood. And so, you know, the impacts of that are pretty clear to see, at least to me, and um, I completely, I get it. Um, you know, if I was king for a day, I would make turning left on Mission Street a criminal offense because I hate it so much. But um, the fact is that we are um, incredibly limited, um, especially in this location, in terms of what we can require, not only um, from the state and Caltrans in terms of doing the markings on the street, um, but also in terms of what we can require from the developer. So for example, um, legally with this project, we can't require any parking. And generally speaking, there are entitlements that we do have to give once housing projects meet certain criteria, and that's state law. And when you fight it, um, the only people really who benefit are the lawyers, right? And so we'd like to avoid that too. 
Um, with that said, um, I do think there is something that we might be able to address on the parking concerns, and I do um, agree with the developer in terms of creating a parking program. They are effective. I've lived in areas with parking programs that really do limit um, the amount of impact that it has on particular side streets, on particular neighborhoods. The problem here is that the developer, as I understand it, cannot be the person or at least the party to initiate a parking program. And so what I would like to see is uh, potentially outreach with, uh, I believe the name is Bruce Thomas or whoever is sort of the, the point of contact for the do for neighbors. And this would be more of a direction of staff um, and it would be to request that staff do out, outreach with the head of do for neighbors, um, Bruce Thomas on the neighborhood parking program indicating what they will need to do to establish one and then also uh, making them aware um, to the extent that they're not of the developer's commitment to, as I understand it, pay for two years of a parking program or at least two years of investment in getting a parking program started. So whatever that means, um, I think outreach to the neighborhood group and um, seeing if this is something that they want to move forward on would go a long way with that particular neighborhood. And so um, that would be my motion. Okay, well, we'll not quite having motion yet. No? We'll, okay. be, we'll be holding that and you'll be adding that to the, to the motion? Um, or did you want to treat that separately? How do you want to do this? Do you want to... Well, I, I think you we're going to have... The floor we we, we could put it on the floor yeah. now. I'm um, fine. We could also do it later. I'm fine to do it separately because I don't want to yeah, we'll hold the project hostage, time. you know, if, if there are people that disagree. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. Would you like to state exactly what your um, motion will sure. be? Sure. Uh, I would move that staff do outreach with the head of do for neighbors, Bruce Thomas, or uh, another person in his stead, whoever that person is, on the neighborhood parking program, indicating what they will need to do to establish one, kind of walk them through the process um, of what that really means and what the options are, and then also make them aware of the developer's commitment to pay for two years of the parking program or otherwise fund and um, participate in designing a parking program. Is there a second to that motion? Um, I'd second and then offer maybe a friendly amendment. Um, I, could we up the developer pay for five years? Hmm. Can we get the developer up here? Um, House three. Can we... Can we say that I'm willing to consider it favorably, but I'd want to study the numbers, how big the parking um, zone is going to be? Um, but I think I've shown in the past that I'm committed to try and ameliorate the impact on the neighbors, so I will consider it favorably, but I can't commit to it at this point without knowing what the numbers are. Um, oh, okay. Um. Um, I just wanted to point out that the okay. condition of approval that um, right. we had recommended was just the block, just the one block of the floor would be um, the phone. Could you just, I'm just curious, what's the cost of that um, annual um, parking permit program? We've got Curtis Buzenar from Public Works here. Okay. On to that. Um, I'd also like to add while Curtis is coming up that um, we really don't have an objective development standard right. um, regarding what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So from a legal perspective, I think it would be a, a difficult per, uh, condition to pursue unless the applicant were agreeable and wanted to offer it up. Thank, thank you for that clarification. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, John had his hand. Up. Just as a point of clarification, does this fall into the same category of, of uh, creating impediments to development? In terms it could. Of, in a legal it, sense? It, it could, okay. sir. I mean, it's, it's a cost. Okay. So I'm Curtis Buzenart. Good evening, commissioners. I'm with Public Works Engineering. So the parking permit program, Eric touched on it. We can't require it. We have no standard objective for it. Uh, the residents have to initiate it. They're the ones that have to go through the process and come to the city. They'll vote on it. It's a two-thirds majority vote to pass. Uh, the cost would be associated with it is for the actual parking permit. The city incurs the cost of the signage and all that stuff. But other than that, it has to get voted on. It, they don't receive a vote. And it, people impact it. They consider it a no vote. So mm -hmm. there is some. Okay. Um, go ahead. 
Yeah, and so I lived up on McMillan, um, closer to the university in that parking program, and my understanding was it's not just the permits, like the printing out the physical permits, but then also the uh, covering the, the parking enforcement as well. Isn't that part of it as well, or? Not to my understanding. Okay. I think that's incurred in the cost of right. the actual permit. I don't know what the limitations are, how many permits you can get per household. I'm not sure of that. I can't answer that question. Right, because the permits, the fee for the permits pays for the program. Correct. Correct. Right. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry, Thank just you. to sorry, just to add okay. something to what Curtis has said. Um, so I actually, uh, so I found the fees that would that it would cost per permit. So I believe every household can buy up to five permits, and they cost thirty dollars per permit. Okay. Thank you for that. Per year, correct? Yes, okay. per year. One year. Yeah. And how much is your standard ticket? That I'm not sure. I think it's $44. So if you get one ticket, it's not worth it to try and skip around. That's what I tried to do. And then I got a ticket, and then I went and bought the permit. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 Nope, that's okay. To that point, I would like to say this is just a general planning axiom as far as I'm concerned, but parking permit programs tickets come from the program from having a program and parking permit programs they tend to coalesce around a particular uh, driver a university or a development etc and there are some unfortunate side effects just in the sense that it becomes a donut where the problem is pushed to the outside of that donut and then that those neighborhoods are affected and then it gets they say we want parking and it just continues to grow and then eventually the entire mm -hmm. you know you push it out to the so east. i am going to ask that we um return what we had was a motion on the floor we had a second we had a request for a friendly amendment and we were getting information that would help us determine whether or not um, to accept at right now the decision is whether to accept a friendly amendment to go from two years to five years or simply to put the motion as stated on the floor could i ask the maker of the friendly uh, amendment could we do anywhere between two and five years as determined by the process in the neighborhood sure sure and i accept so there is a motion on the thank you very much for it that was very helpful um, as were the other comments, I think we, we um, uh, elucidating some more information on the impacts of parking pro programs, is an, it's exactly the right time to be doing that. Um, but our motion on the floor now is um, to require the developer to uh, pay for a parking program for the one block that is included um, in the con current condition of approval for a period between two and five years? Well, my understanding is that we couldn't put a condition of approval on the project, but we can direct staff to facilitate the outreach and to let the neighborhood and the developer come to their own democratic conclusion, correct? That's sort of, that was my thought. Sure, we can facilitate so, the and, outreach. And yeah. that, sounds, that sounds different. So that is a request to staff to facilitate a conversation. So that correct. is what is being. Here, I'll, I'll restate. Um, I'm, the motion is that's to uh, direct staff to do outreach with the head of do neighbors Bruce Thomas or uh, another head of do neighbors on the neighborhood parking program indicating what they will need to do to establish one and the to make them aware of the developers commitment to pay from anywhere between two and five years for the parking program okay are there discussion on this motion further discussion on this motion yes please go ahead Thank you, um, Vice Chair. I, could I also suggest that maybe we um, put an end point on that as well, maybe up till the time that the building permit's finaled or um, maybe a year after the building permit's finaled so that that, that obligation is not in perpetuity? That, that's a good idea. So um, to specify that um, we're asking staff to um, facilitate a discussion, which sounds like it's already happening to me from um, between the developer um, and the neighbors on on this um, parking program. Um, and that staff will continue to work with the neighbors to try to come up with 
come to an agreement up until the time that the building permit is issued. Can, can we see the language on the screen by chance? Are we ready for that? I just want to make sure we're yes. looking at what we really want to do here. Thank you. Much bigger. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so old. Okay. And we're we're up until building permit issuance. It's up until building permit final application. Oh yeah. Okay. It's finaled. Is that, is that what? This is up to the maker of the motion. Yeah, the I, I, what did you mean? I would defer to staff. Um, I mean, I heard up to one year after the permit is finaled or by the time the permit is final. I mean, I. what do you think is reasonable? I think, I think I also heard up to one year after the building permit is finaled. I think that's fine. That'll give us some flexibility. And um, I think the... Um, the longer we allow that window, um, you know, with that extra buffer of a year, um, it might be an opportunity for the residents to get a feel for whether it's really necessary or not. So uh, that's a good point. one year would probably be the way to go. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I think that's helpful. Okay, are there, is everybody clear on what this is? Are there further comments or, um, about this? Did you want to speak further about it? I do have concerns about it. Um, and first of all, I really appreciate um, the concern for the impact on the neighbors um, because of this. And I, I think that's, that's really what I'm hearing in this. Um, and I also hear that on the part of the developer, that there's a real concern and a real interest in working together. Um, I feel concerned about, um, and I think we've satisfied that, we're not requiring um, an additional commitment, um, and I think that that would be unacceptable um, and illegal. Um, but encouraging a discussion um, to flesh out and understand the immediate neighborhood impacts, um, what I'm really hearing there is that we're keeping um, a dialogue open. Um, but I, I do want to be clear that we're not requiring um, the offer of two years of financial assistance to get a parking neighborhood parking program up and going um, to go further than that. Um, it'll be at the discretion of, of um, the developers, but I agree with Mr. Marlett that um, continuing that discussion for a year after I think is going to help, um, and, and as is the case with many things about this project, I think it's really going to help our city understand um, how to integrate these new housing types into our community. And I think that having the discussion is helpful. So um, as it was revised, I am going to support this motion. Does anybody else have any comments they'd like to make? Okay, with that, let's call, have a roll call vote. Uh, oh, just to sorry. clarify, there, I, I'm looking for the condition, um, but the other condition that would be affected by this motion would be the one that we already have um, that speaks to paying for two years, and we would just include the language two to five. Well, that there will be that further for that there will be further discussion between the neighborhood and the developer to, right. to extend that. Right. Okay. Okay, you've got that in the existing condition. Someone's keeping track. Okay, with that, roll call vote. Commissioner Conway. Aye. Dawson? Aye. McKelvey? Aye. Paul Hemis? Aye. Okay, that motion carries. Uh, Commissioner Dawson? Yeah, I just wanted to move on to some of their parts. So um, I had a couple of uh, clarifying questions and then perhaps some comments to follow up. Um, I, I did not see in the condition of approval um, I did see uh, number 36 that talks about the affordable housing agreement. I did not see in the uh, conditions of approval, and I may have missed it, um, something s speaking about the replacement housing and that being part of the conditions of approval. It did, did I miss it, or is it not in there?
You're, and when you when you say that, I mean, because there is that overlap that's allowed in state law, are you speaking to uh, mention of the affordability levels? Uh, I'm just mentioning uh, about the re the replacement requirement. Like that isn't called out. It is called out that there is an affordable housing agreement. It needs to follow state law, but there is not a condition that says that that there needs to be the the required two bedroom replacement unit. And I I'd like to see that as a condition of approval. If I did indeed miss it, I think we can add that in um, and just uh, revise that condition to specify <clears throat> the inclusionary units. You know the total units and and which is for which. You know how many units are required for replacement. How many units are required for inclusion? Yeah, and then the total. I, I just would like to see like the word replacement in a condition. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just yep. to be really clear, um, the other question also is for staff. Um, if you could just, and I don't want to drag this out for everybody, but I, I, I'm just wondering, like, as I use bike as my primary primary mode of transportation, and I'll tell you, you cannot pay me to bike on mission ever. Um, we've had fatalities as a community on mission. Um, it's a real issue. Um, it's scary enough to drive down Mission, let alone bike. And so I'm just wondering, like, can you talk about any discussions we've had or like the process to work with Caltrans to get protected bike lanes, to do something? Because if, if we're saying that we're encouraging folks not to drive, um, uh, you know, I, I have real concerns, especially that these are SROs, likely a lot of students who come to town and don't really know the history of that street. I see students at the beginning of every quarter riding down that, and I literally roll down the window and say, go over to King, do not ride this road. <laughs> so I'm really, wor I'm really concerned about that. So this public works did look at that in the past about bike lanes on Mission Street. It's just not feasible okay. with the design, the roadway width. Mm -hmm. They did put up an alternative bike route on King Street, as you know, you probably use that. Mm -hmm. So as far as, yeah, I, I don't foresee that okay. happening. Is there ways that we can work with Caltrans to get signage to like direct folks to the alternate bike path and, and also direct safe sp spots to cross, you know? Sure, I mean, that's been on public works radar for years. We have worked effortlessly trying to do that. Okay. I can, uh, we do have a new transportation manager. Mm -hmm. I can spark up that conversation with him if it's not Sarkey. But once again, it, it's, mm -hmm. I know Mission Street's a scary street to ride. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know, if I could follow up on that point, um, I do think that it is within our, our purview um, to request that the developer be sure and provide um, informational materials on safe bike routes because, I mean, I agree, I, I was planning my bike route out of this project as well. And, you know, between the rail trail and King Street and, you know, UCSC has that parking I think, hub at um, CVS. Mm -hmm. I think that um, you know, just asking to provide information in the new tenant would go a long way for residents of this property. It doesn't solve the larger, larger problem. But, but I thought that was a good yeah, point. Yeah, I guess this would be a question to the developer. Would you be amenable to a condition um, to have, you know, perhaps, you know, permanent signage or something, you know, doing? Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah. Before you even raised the question, I had my hand yeah, up. Yeah, I, I saw say, that. I'm going po to yeah. put posters okay. on the bike lockers directing cyclists yeah. to King Street, okay. to the bike trail, mm -hmm. uh, and to all the other safe okay. routes. Yeah, and I don't think this needs to be a condition of approval. I think um, a, a request that's been responded to is adequate for me, at least. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I would like to see it as a condition of approval. Um, so I probably will go ahead and motion to see if I can get the votes here. Um, I appreciate the bell verb being amenable to it, but it's just nice to have it in writing. It's also something that we can point to when people come to us and say, hey, what about the biking? We can show that the developer has, you know, is going above and beyond to, as you have for in, in many cases here. So I would like to um, propose a condition of approval um, that the developer will post um, signage indicating safe bike routes in, in the surrounding area um, and leave it kind of open so uh, we can leave some flexibility for the developer. So I'd like to motion a condition of approval. See if I can get a second here. 
I'll, I'll second for discussion. And I guess what that means is I need to hear more about this. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm definitely know where you're heading, but just want to know. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I want to just put in writing what the developer said that they're already going to do, which is, you know, they're going to uh, post, um, you know, the city can provide, um, you know, the safe bike routes in the area. We already know that um, um, Public Works just said that there's an alternate bike route on King. And so just directing people to that, directing the safe route to get to the CPS bike um, I just worry about n new folks to the community. They don't know these things. They don't know the history of mission and, and um, you know, just putting it in writing. Um, again, um, you know, it's good to hear the developer is already going in that direction. I just love to see it in writing. So that's, that's all I'm, I, I'm not trying to make this onerous, but I, I just uh, would like to kind of set it down in writing is all. Maybe Mr. Rosenhardt could address this, but the city does have a number of safety guides and route guides and things like that, do they not? I believe so, but I, I don't know how they're up to date. But obviously the rail trail just went in recently, uh, segment one and two, I believe, I work on segment three. So they're, they're active, we are actively increasing bicycle routes in the city of Portland. From uh, east-west movements to south movements. But to Commissioner's point, I'm wondering whether there is material that could be, we can perhaps condition providing it, displaying it uh, as part of the lobby uh, experience, something like that, rather, rather, because there's a, I mean, in a way, it would, it would, if you said it was a condition for the developer to make the information, it would require constant updating as these things I think you should condition it to work with Public Works Traffic Engineering on a safe bicycle route for the for Mission Street bike route alternative. Yeah, that's that. Um, I'm waiting to be called. Um, go ahead. I'm waiting. I'm waiting to turn here. Um, I, I, I was going to say that maybe we can uh, amend this motion, uh, the language of the motion, to include as provided by Public Works so that it doesn't put it on the onus mm -hmm. of the developer to constantly be figuring out what the safe routes are. Um, that should be part of what we're doing in the city. You know, we're, we're prioritizing bike transit, so we need to have these materials. And so can, can we just go ahead and add that to the condition um, as provided by, um, you know, safe biking routes as provided by uh, city public works or just the city and whomever. <laughs> public works has a bicycle coordinator yeah. Right, they do. And, and I just would imagine those materials, and so so then that would again leave it up to the developer whether they wanted to print out a sign or they just wanted to have brochures. And I think that that, as written, I think the bar would be fairly low, and give the developer maximum flexibility to do what they were already going to do anyway. Uh, Mr. Marlet. Yeah, and it looks like um, the bike maps are provided through the RTC. Okay. So um, I knew they were somewhere. Yeah, somewhere. Google helped me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you for thank you for your help with that. So do we have some revised language? Uh, do, do we do, do we have something based on? Uh, can we take a look at that and tweak it a little bit? Um, then we shall post. Um, so I'm, I'm just trying to not sort of pin this in and just make it the lowest bar. So uh, you said it's by the RTC. Uh, I want to help me with some language just as provided by local government or something really broad. Yeah, we, we could say the regional transportation agency or, or other. Um, or the city. Yeah, I don't know that we have them, I think. Well, if we may we do, have we them in the future, yeah. and they may be more city-specific, is what sure. I'm saying. Yeah. So I just want to leave yeah, it. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It should be flexible. Uh, or other appropriate <laughs> local authority. Yeah, or sure. That's... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's okay. Okay, are you happy with the language? Yes, I'm happy with the language. Uh, go ahead, Commissioner McKellar. Sorry. That's right. Looking at the language... 
Uh, the owner shall post signage is still in there, and I'm wondering if that's, I'm, I'm trying to get away from having a, a static, you know, thing that, you know, the sign company made, these stick in the, in the ground or a plaque on the wall. I'm, I'd like it to be something that's dynamic as these routes develop. It's it's the brochure that's next to the mystery spot. You know, I'm, I'm just, you know, it's it's something that that people can access and see, and it's going to change, and... But it's just it's just talking about a place to have those things for the tenants. I agree okay, I that I wouldn't I wouldn't but, confine it just to the bike lockers. You know, I'd put them in the lobby. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it would be information that that renters have when they receive their information yes. package. Yes. So, you know, they exactly make information available. Okay. So I don't know how okay. I don't, what you feel comfortable. Uh, modifying. I mean. I, the signage can be dynamic with a QR code or something like that. Um, I, I also know that uh, younger folks don't take a lot of brochures. Um, so, uh, you know, having a sign where they could actually visibly see it and take a picture on their phone or hit the QR code, to me, actually would probably be more effective for the demographic that's probably going to live there. Um, so I, I would be much, uh, she'll make information available. Yeah, there we go. We're sure, that's pretty flexible. Okay. Um, On the site. Well, about, yeah, and uh, sorry. Let's just come back and be recognized by the chair before we go forward. Um, Commissioner McKelvey, did you want to finish your comment? Just, I, I know that we talked about um, sort of Caltrans overlaps and transportation overlaps about, you know, signage to direct people that are on mission. And, and I think that was directed at people that may not even live at this address. I'm not sure if that was the intent. But for this project it seems uh appropriate to make a place for that information to be qr codes are great and and uh the tenant manual is great the residence manual um i just uh it is broad but i think in a way that's kind of what we're aiming for to to be dynamic provide you know the opportunity to be dynamic rather than prescriptive Commissioner Paul Hamus, did you want to make a comment? Nothing. nothing. You're Good language. language. Okay. Um, I guess um, what I'd like to say is I'm actually not in favor of a proliferation of conditions of approval that are going to bobble along with the land forever. Um, I really appreciate that um, the developer is willing to step up and um, play a role in making sure that people get educated. Um, you know, that said, um, making the point, and I do feel like this project is going to be a model for projects to come. Um, so making a point that um, developers are responsible um, to make sure that their tenants are educated in terms of how to safely get around um, as a pedestrian or as a bicyclist. I do think that's important. So I'm just about overcoming my um, regret at the proliferation of conditions uh, <laughs> that I think have, I, and, um, and I say that not because I really think this is very well intended and I, and I completely agree with it because I bike over there too all the time and it, it is a nightmare. Um, so um, with that, I think we have language and both the maker of the motion and the second have agreed to the language. Um, and with that, can we um, uh, give a vote? Commissioner Conway? Yes. Aye. McKelvey? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Paul Hamas? Aye. OK. Um, so does anybody else want to um, have, have any discussion at this point? If not, I have some comments um, that I'd like to make. Um, and for starters, I'd like to thank the team um, and also the staff. I really agree that this is the right project for this location. Um, and it is about time um, that, you know, it's Mission Street has become more and more derelict. And the fact that this project comes in and has worked hard to address a really complex situation, I think is, um, I really appreciate that. Um, and especially, I know you worked hard to address neighbor concerns. I know they're not all addressed. Um, and, uh, but I appreciate that and thank you. Um, I really appreciate the accommodation for delivery trucks. 
We've uh, talked about that with every single multifamily project that comes forward in every location around the city. And I think this is a creative solution. I don't know how scalable it is, but this is an idea that um, you know I'll sure have in my mind for projects that uh, come forward. Um, I also think that the plan to accommodate the accessible unit without the cost of an elevator was thoughtful. I appreciate your concerns, um, most definitely, but um, one of the many obstacles to getting this kind of project has been the cost. And um, I think this was a, a thoughtful approach to, um, to meet all the needs. Um, and, you know, three-story walk-up seems like a great idea to me. Um, and also, I mean, I could go on about um, reestablishing Mission Street as a vibrant commercial corridor with 24-hour use. I could go on about that, but um, I think you did a really good job of that. Um, a comment that I'd like to make that, you know, maybe we don't all think about is that um, site assembly is really vital to getting any redevelopment of Mission Street. Um, these parcels are really shallow. Um, they're really difficult to um, develop without site assembly, which adds costs and complexity um, to every project. Um, so, you know, again, the community acknowledged that Mission Street has outgrown its single family home character decades ago. Um, but um, because they're so shallow, it's been really hard to move forward. So it's nice to see this happening. Um, I also thought that the steps you took to make open space usable and pleasant um, for tenants and respectful of neighbors, I really appreciate the steps that you took to do that. Um, and then I also want to make a comment and welcome the get-go property management firm, um, who I'd never heard of. Um, but I know from experience that Santa Cruz can be surprisingly isolated by that road. Um, and so getting a first project over here for a new entity is challenging. Um, and I've, I've been talking to developer or property management firms about this for a long time. Um, and this firm seems, um, seems good. Um, I was really happy to see the kind of projects that they've worked in. I really liked um, their management plan and getting a draft management plan that doesn't make me sneer at this stage um, made me really happy. <laughs> um, so um, thank you for that. Um, and I do think that property management is really an underrated um, and underestimated uh, component to making a project like this work in a neighborhood. And it's one of the reasons why I've always complained about all of the, you know, the mapped um, condo projects that turn into rentals because you have no one to talk to. Um, you can't form a relationship when you've got, you know, 50 different owners who are taking different property management approaches. And um, I know that, that it might not seem like that to neighbors now, but for me, knowing that you're going to have someone that people are going to know and can form a relationship with, um, I think it's going to make a real difference to the livability of this project um, within the neighborhood. Um, and uh, uh, let's see, I'd like to put in, while we're talking about property management, um, an extra plug, um, another one of my pet peeves, which is um, to ask if you would be willing to make an extra effort, this is not going to be a COA, this is just a conversation, um, but to utilize, try to utilize that accessible unit um, for someone um, who needs it, um, which is problematic. We have a huge number of accessible units that are not being used um, by people who have physical limitations, and there's a whole set of reasons uh, for that. But I'd just like to ask you to be sure to do outreach to um, the Central Coast Center for Independent Living, um, which, and make sure that their folks know that there's going to be an opportunity. And I know the property management firm has some choices and some latitude. Um, you can't discriminate for anybody, just like you can't uh, discriminate against. But you can do outreach, and there's a lot of things that can be done. Um, and I think that that would be important. I also think that there was a tiny typo in management plan 9D, which said that the maintenance of vehicles is included but not limited to changing oil. Again, this is super petty. Um, <laughs> um, not necessarily our role, but in case some, in case you didn't see it. Um, and that concludes um, my comments. 
Does anybody else have any requests? Just had a couple more things. Okay, go ahead. I just want to circle back to the affordability, and I'll be really frank that, um, you know, I, I'm not going to make a motion around that because I know that I don't have the votes tonight, but I just do want to state for the public again that, um, you know, the state policy, as staff has pointed out, interacts with local municipality pro um, ordinances and policies. Um, but but we do have some latitude about how we interpret things and what we push. And, you know, we have some latitude about pushing interpretation around affordability. Um, I, I feel like this should be a five unit affordable project, not a four unit affordable project. But again, I just wanted to state that for the record. Um, I'm not going to make a motion around that. I do want to really thank the developer um, and the architect as well um, for taking in uh, the community comments. We do have a lot of projects come that aren't as responsive. Um, and so I, I think it is um, really to be commended that you took as many steps as you can. Um, I, I will always continue to sing the song of affordability. Um, we need affordable units now. We need as many as we can. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we need to, as a city, we need to be pushing it where we can and pushing interpretation where we can. So I just wanted to put that out there. And, um, you know, I, I do agree that this is the type of the development that the east side has been seeing um, constantly and it's a big change uh, traffic is really you know regardless of, of what we do now we were designed the traffic flow was designed for single-family homes um, and and it is going to be a tough thing for us to swallow as a community um, we're going to have the same kind of situation on water street with the projects that are going it's going to back up all the way to morrissey through the exchange around the corner um, so <laughs> You know, just want to encourage our staff and our electeds to be thinking about how we can, you know, accommodate this kind of density because it, it, it's here and it will continue to come. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Commissioner Paul Hamas. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to staff for the wonderful report and all the work they did on this. And then also I wanted to just uh, repeat the comments of my my uh, colleagues here about uh, just the the developer team really did go above and beyond in terms of what was required of you to reach out to the neighborhoods and to actually take in some of the public comment and and be responsive to that in the design process and everything and um, I think it's a it's a good um, precedent to set especially for the west side as more and more of these developments come in um, you know how is the conceptualization of development teams and development in general going to be conceptualized with um, you know people who aren't quite as responsive so thank you very much for the amount of work and the amount of outreach you did to um, take some of the neighborhood concerns into into your plans um, just as a you know a general comment um, you know these types of projects are I mean as my colleagues have noted are going to keep coming um, there is change going to be headed on to, you know, every major transit corridor in the city, but especially SoCal, especially Ocean, especially Mission Street. And, um, you know, the public should be aware of that. And, uh, again, there's limited ability for us as, you know, public officials or, you know, the city council themselves to really um, make greater demands on these types of projects. And so things do get complicated. They do get messy. Um, you know, not everybody is going to be happy with these projects, but at this point in time, this is what the state has decided the direction of the California housing industry is going. And, um, you know, it's, it is what it is. And we are to try to mitigate as much of these impacts as possible. So um, I just wanted to put those comments out there. And while I love, um, you know, the, the three-story height that you guys have done to this, um, I think it's perfect for Mission Street. I think it's very appropriate for the location, for the neighborhood. I think it has, um, you know, a good mix of uses um, and uh, a decent mix of units in terms of size, in terms of function, everything like that. So, um, you know, this is an ideal situation from, from our side of things. So thank you. And I think that's it. Did you have more comments? I would entertain a motion. 
I will move the staff recommendation, although I should probably say it out loud. Sorry, let me pull it up really quick. Okay. No, don't need to see myself. Okay, there we go. Okay. Um, going to, yeah, move the staff recommendation that the Planning Commission acknowledge the environmental determination and approve the residential demolition authorization permit, boundary adjustment, special use permit, design permit, and density bonus request based on the findings listed below and the attached conditions of approval in Exhibit A. And uh, did you want to make, uh, acknowledge the, um, as amended? We have a couple of it. Or As did, a, we, did we, we voted on those? These separate. are. I apologize. Yeah, we That's voted on those separately. So this is I'm included, talking. right? The conditions are, are are included, and then the uh, the motion to our staff is already part. passed. Correct. Yeah. So that would include our revised conditions that Ms. Zoe would have. Yes. Okay, great. That's why I wanted to do it. Thanks. Can I second? Please do. <laughs> I second the motion. Okay. Is there any further discussion? With that, can we have a roll call vote? Commissioner Conway? Yes. Aye. Dawson? Aye. McKelvey? Aye. Paul Hamus? Aye. And with that, uh, the uh, motion passes. Um, and again, congratulations. Thank you for all your hard work, neighbors, developers, staff. It's going to be a good project. Um, OK. So moving on, and thank you, staff. Um, everyone who came, um, it was really helpful um, that you came. Thank you. So moving on to information items. Yeah, just a couple of quick updates. Um, first, the water department's in the process of um, doing a, a fairly significant upgrade to the Graham Hill water treatment plant, which is sort of an isolated area of the city. It's surrounded by unincorporated property. Um, and they're in the process of preparing an environmental impact report for that. So most, most of that project is exempt from any uh, local zoning codes under state law, but there are a couple of components of the project um, that will need entitlements and would involve the Planning Commission. Um, on Tuesday, the City Council took action to um, invoke these provisions of the zoning ordinance that um, essentially puts them in the driver's seat for approving the permits with a recommendation from the Planning Commission. Um, and there's a variety of reasons for that outlined in the staff report. And I'm happy to send you all a link to, to that report. Um, Thank you, that'd be helpful. Yeah, so just wanted to give you a heads up on that. Um, the draft EIR is expected to be available for public review in the late summer, early fall timeframe, and then we're, we're thinking uh, spring of next year is when you'll be considering those entitlements. So I uh, just wanted to give you an update on that. And then as far as schedules goes, we have nothing yet scheduled for the July 6th meeting. So there's a pretty good chance you might have a holiday week. Um, on the 20th, we do have a tentative application um, scheduled involving a mixed use project on SoCal Avenue. And that's all I have, unless you have anything to add. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Just want to make note of that. Um, and we have no subcommittee or advisory bodies uh, right now, so we'll have no oral reports. We did refer one item to a future agenda, which was the minutes from May 18th. Um, and with that, this meeting is adjourned. Great. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Great job. Thank you. Really nice job. Okay, the mic.